This is All India Radio in the program Spotlight. Now we bring you a discussion on G20 Energy Transition Working Group meeting. The participants are Anil Razdan, former Energy Secretary, and S. Rangabhashyam, AIR correspondent. Mr. Anil Razdan, warm welcome to this program on All India Radio. And uh, we would be talking about the first G20 Energy Transitions Working Group the meeting which is being held under India's presidency in Bangalore from today onwards. Just for the benefit of our listeners, uh, tell us about the importance of energy transition as such. Energy transition actually been a theme for the last decade and a half, two almost I would say, but more so in the last decade where we have to move away from fossil fuels as the principal supplier of our energy to non-fossil fuel use, to fuels which are not leaving or generating the carbon footprint on our environment. Because this carbon footprint, especially by the industrialized countries, last century or two, particularly after the Industrial Revolution, has, in the view of many scientists, left an impact which is increasing global temperatures and going to cause climate uncertainties bringing about extremes of weather climate, more frequent heat waves, squalls, storms, hurricanes, and also increase in the water level of the sea, which will lead to submergence of quite a few areas and important cities and populations across the world, creating problems of adoption of new technologies as well as adaptation. Now, this is really a a mission which globally has been accepted in recent years. Particularly, I would say, a landmark uh, assembly was in Paris where a view was taken that we have to work collectively because earlier we were proceeding by the Kyoto Protocols where there was a common but differentiated responsibility. Paris onwards, the developed countries, I would say, I mean, I personally feel unfairly forced the others also to come on board virtually on the same terms. And countries gave their nationally determined contributions, or virtually national commitments, as to how much reduction in uh, fossil fuel usage they will resort to. Because fossil fuels are supposed to be the principal culprits yeah. in this global warming, because whether it is coal or petroleum or natural gas, they leave behind an imprint of uh, carbon. Excessive presence is leading to this. Mr. Razan, whenever we talk about, you know, switching over to greener fuels, predominantly the focus is on vehicles and passenger cars and, you know, transport vehicles and others. But don't you think this energy transition has to be, in the real sense, comprehensive? I mean, you know, you have to look at other major, you know, transport modes as well, transportation modes as well, like, say, aircrafts or, you know, railways and even ships. So it has to be comprehensive, not just the passenger cars. You're quite right, Mr. Basham. It's not only, I would say, not only the different forms of transport, covering all kinds of transport. Of course, we used to use horse carriages and that kind of transport, bullock carts. That was animal-driven. But we have farm machinery. We have tractors across the world today, which is, and our harvester combines and all, which are all working on fossil fuels. At the same time, electricity generation, which is driving electricity into our homes for various activities, is also largely fossil fuel based. You see, there is coal, for example, in our country is the dominant supplier, China and other countries. Yes, there are also gas-driven electricity generation, which again is uh, heavy on carbon. Now, all this is sought to be replaced by greener forms of energy. With the advent of solar and wind energy, solar has been a great source of heat. We've only been, unfortunately, been using it in recent years, talking about it for electricity. But I think we've been wasting a huge potential of solar as the primary heating source, which for civilizations was the primary source of heating. Now, heat is required for most processes to generate heat from solar sources, To generate electricity from solar sources, electricity from wind, electricity from hydro water. You see, because hydro, again, because of the gradient, that fall 
in the energy, potential energy, trapping that potential energy to forms of electricity, which will be driving. That has been one of the major drivers in North America and also in Europe. But in India, we have a limitation. We initially had about a 50% mix of uh, hydropower through the 50s and I would say early 60s. But this gradually, because of uh, excessive need for new energy or electricity, we had to switch to coal. And there were also problems of uh, submergence because of large dams. But there is need, I think, for integrated planning. That is, water is also an equally important resource. And we've got to utilize water in many ways. There is Today, there is talk of pumped hydro. Yeah. That is, you keep pumping water from lower to higher or higher to lower, depending on the situation. Because when you're having intermittent power, particularly from the sources like solar and wind, where you're not in control of the power generation, you have to depend excessively on nature and its play. So at times, you may be generating much more than you are needing at that point of time, you need to store it. Now, either you store it in batteries, again, which are chemical batteries, or you push that energy from a lower water body, lift it to a higher water body, and when you have a depletion of power in the system from natural sources, that yeah. time you use that hydropower to make up for the shortfall. Mr. Razan, I want to bring in this point as well that, you know, in today's uh, function, it is actually a three-day event. Some 150 participants, including, you know, uh, participants from G20 member countries are there. We also have nine special invitees from guest countries like Bangladesh, Egypt, Mauritius, Netherlands, Nigeria, Oman, Singapore, UAE and Spain. What does that mean? Why this special emphasis on special invitees? Is it to nudge these countries as well to, you know, join the mainstream? Absolutely, because you see, the G20 membership is a very large membership and a very diverse membership. For example, China, India, USA, Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, Japan, Turkey, UK, France, Italy, South Africa, South Korea, Canada, Saudi Arabia, Australia. It's a very diverse mix of huge populations technological advances, countries, countries which are rich, countries which are not so rich. But by and large, the established economies, so to say, of scale and also of uh, certain high technology and high capital availability, all countries are not on the same level. Now, these countries, guest countries that you mentioned, say Egypt or Bangladesh, these are countries which are equally important, which have huge populations in their own landed territory, which are economic drivers in their own area. And I think these are well could well in the future be potential partners of such forum. It is virtually a smaller assembly of the United Nations today. Countries which are, I would say that yes, they drive global policies, they drive global economies, and yeah. they will be driving a lot of energy use. So it is better to get these other countries also, which are on the threshold virtually, I would say, of joining this assembly of countries in more senses than one. Right. The ultimate aim, of course, is to, as we've been having conferences of global things, but then you see it gets very diverse and dilute. This right. is a more intense group, and I think it's an excellent idea to be calling in these invitees because I remember, for example, in the International Energy Agency, which was a group of the OECD countries, India and China were invited, and I, as Power Secretary, was invited twice to its assembly in Paris, yes. in its meetings. Now, the whole idea was that India and China, well, you can't think of any global international energy meet without these two countries. But then we were careful that, yes, we are not the same league as those economically advanced countries. We are still developing in our own way. But a major stakeholder. Yes, a major stakeholder. So now we have been admitted as an associate in that. So there is a common responsibility, but I'm one of those who feels that there is a differentiated responsibility. The rich nations and those who are having much higher per capita emissions have a greater responsibility mm -hmm. to discharge and not to be using energy transition as a means of economic enrichment or creating another kind of, I would say, a technological imperialism. Mr. Now, Razan, let's also focus on the priority areas 
of the Energy Transition Working Group meeting. Among the priorities, we have low-cost financing for energy transition, energy security, diversified supply chains, energy efficiency and, and all these. Let's talk about low-cost financing. We all acknowledge the fact that, you know, this transition from one source of energy, specifically fossil fuel driven, to cleaner energy needs a lot of investment. It is capital intensive. Don't you think it's time to bring in the international monetary agencies, whether it is the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund or, you know, the regional organizations like Asian Development Bank and others to bring about a big change? We need to have really low cost financing models and workable models at that. You're absolutely right, because you see, investment is at the heart of any new energy investment. And particularly when you are talking of energy transition, you are talking of a replacement of one technology with another. There are countries where energy needs are much greater in terms of growing. The gap is there. The hunger is there for energy. Now, these countries are not necessarily the world's richest countries. In fact, unfortunately, they fall largely in the less rich bracket, and some may even call them poorer countries. Now, these countries are very important, and I've always held a view that if you say it's one planet, it also means it's one citizen. Every global citizen has equal rights. And if you have capital which is at 3% in a particular country and 17% in another country, and that happens to be a poorer country, any energy investment or transition, that becomes all the more difficult and imperative because there are other investment of, I would say, priorities which come before that country. You have to remove poverty. You have to invest in education. You've got to invest in health care. You have to invest in housing. You have to invest in roads, transport, so many other things. So when you see you are talking of development along with transition, unless you provide cheaper capital, unless you provide technology or sharing of technology and not using it as an instrument of further enriching yourself in this process of transition, That truly, I think, would meet the spirit of what is the theme that India has put for its presidency, that is Vasudeva Kutambakam, that is one earth, one family, one future. Now, if we have one family, one future, then surely in a family, you must share the kitty. And the kitty starts with the money, with the moolah. If you want the change in technology, please put the technology on the table. Please put the money on the table. Let us share all that. But even in a family, Mr. Razdan, like, you know, there could be members who would be earning more. So they could probably chip in more than, of than course, because probably the a, poorer cousins. You see, if it's a joint family, then it's an insult if you tell him that you are too poor to afford this. In fact, the per capita energy usage across the world is so highly skewed. So, so is per capita emission. India is even today, after having developed over the last decades or so, is still contributing only about one-third per capita emission of carbon. Now, we do not have to carry any guilt. The guilt that is to be carried is by countries who have caused this global warming disproportionately. We've all contributed. But those who have contributed disproportionately per capita, because if we say it's one family, it's one planet, it has to be one citizen also. So there I think we are uh, absolutely on track and India has an added responsibility being a developing uh, developing country itself and sitting at the presidency of this forum at the moment. I think our responsibility and also our opportunity for leadership and to give the proper and equitable sense of direction to a fair and equitable global order right. comes to the forefront. Mr. Razan, on that positive, optimistic note, let's wind up this discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. You were listening to a discussion on G20 Energy Transition Working Group Meeting. The participants were Anil Razdan, former Energy Secretary, and S. Rangabhashyam, AIR Correspondent. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.